television has taught us to think of ourselves as passive observers. That life happens to us and we're just simply watching and not able to make much of a difference in anything. This is a bad attitude. Because actually we're shaping things. If you search through the Buddhist teachings on the, for the source of all things, it says all things are rooted in desire. In other words, our experience of the world is shaped by desire. What you experience right now is a combination of a few things, our acts from the past, acts in the present moment, actually the results from past actions, the action itself in the present moment, and the results of the present actions all combined make your experience of what you're aware of right now. In every case, there's the action, past actions plus present actions. And these are rooted in desire. You act because you want something. If there's no desire, there's no action. And this is how we continue create, creating suffering for ourselves, our whole experience of the six sense spheres, five khandhas. When you get into the details of these things, you see how much you're doing to create them. Experience of the khandhas is shaped by fabrication, sankara. You're aware of the six senses because you direct your attention there. Sometimes you direct your attention to the eye, sometimes the ears, nose, tongue, body, mind. And wherever your attention is directed, that starts getting beginning to proliferate. So this is the problem. That because of our desire, we create suffering. And that principle, principle goes a lot deeper than you might imagine. They tend to think, well, the basic raw materials of experience are just sort of neutral, and then we move in with our desires. Actually, a lot of the raw materials of experience come from desire as well. This is what keeps things going. And this is why the whole point of the Buddhist teaching is to give rise a sense of dispassion for these things. As long as there's passion for these experiences, we're going to keep on creating them, keep on churning them out. And as we said the other day, they will keep churning them out with no thought for quality control. This becomes the mind's basic default mode. And this is the aim of the Buddhist teachings. He talks about in his final evening of his life, he talked about how people were paying homage to him in the wrong way, or devas actually were paying homage with heavenly music, heavenly scents, etc. He said, that's not genuine homage for the Tathagata, for the Buddha. True homage is practicing dharma in accordance with the dharma. And at that point he doesn't explain what he means, but there are other passages in the canon where he defines it. When you're practicing in accordance with the dharma is when you're practicing for the sake of disenchantment, dispassion, for the sake of release. That's practicing the dharma in accordance with the dharma. And of all of his other teachings come down to this point to, to induce dispassion. Like when we chant the fire sermon. He says, look at the eye, it's like it's on fire. Your ear is on fire, your nose, tongue, body, mind are all on fire. With the fires of passion, aversion, delusion, aging, illness, and death. Some people think that 
when the Buddha is being very precise and philosophical, that's his genuine teaching, and his other teachings are simply there to sort of stir you up. Well, the whole point of this is to stir you to practice. All the teachings, whether they're philosophical or poetic, give rise a sense of dispassion. Think of your eyes being on fire, your ear, your nose, your tongue, your body, your mind. The monks listening to this didn't have to have a lot of philosophical terms. All they had to do was think in these terms. It induced a sense of dispassion. There are lots of stories where people were inspired by an image. Water falling out of a out of a dipper. The sound of a song. That was enough to induced his passion. At other times people required something more analytical. In other words, taking whatever it was they were experiencing, just taking it apart. What are, what are your experiences made up of these little moments? Think about the feelings that you pursue. You, everyone wants a feeling of pleasure. How long do feelings of pleasure actually last? Not necessarily all that long. Many times they seem to be extended by your perception of them. You have an idea of pleasure that picks up on the feeling of pleasure. And that perception then lasts, even though the actual feeling is gone. And as the Buddha compares perception to a mirage, you know, there is water someplace, maybe. Sometimes there isn't even water at all. It's just a an illusion of the air currents. And when you get there, the, the actual water is not there. And there's too many times you look at your label of pleasure. Well, where exactly is the feeling of pleasure that corresponds to it? It's gone. It's just a memory now. And then you think about all the energy you put into creating those feelings of pleasure. And all you're left with is mirages. It's enough to make you want to find something else, something that really lasts. And to do that, you have to turn away from your normal pursuits and start looking inside the mind. And when you do that, for the sake of one disenchantment. The Pali word is nibida. Sometimes people translate it as disgust or revulsion, something very strong. And sometimes you need the strong term to re is only the strong term is really appropriate. This total sense of turning away from the things that you used to run toward. And the only reason you would turn away is you begin to realize that they don't offer the satisfaction you thought they had. You feel betrayed. But you can't accuse them of anything, because you were the one who pursued them. You were the one who created them with your desires. It's not their fault. That's where dispassion comes in. In other words, you lose your sense of attraction to these things, but again, it's not replaced by aversion. It's simply the realization that they're not at fault. And so you turn around and just learn how to stop. This is the, an important part of the, the practice. You focus on dispassion, then you focus on cessation. What are you ceasing? You're ceasing your participation in creating these things. It's not that you have to come back and browbeat yourself. You just simply stop. Like a child that grows up to an effort, no longer attracted to playing with dolls. They're playing with little toy cars. They lose their appeal. You grow dispassionate toward them. It doesn't mean you hate them, you just put them aside. But the idea of going back and playing with them and getting involved in the stories that you used to get involved with, you find no attraction to that at all. So the whole purpose of the Buddhist teaching is just this, to undercut that sense of desire we have that keeps creating things. 
and all the teachings on the teachings on the five the five aggregates, the six sense media, the properties of earth, water, wind, fire, space, and consciousness. And his more poetic teachings, the images and the poetry, the images and the suttas. They're all aimed at this direction, to induce that sense of dispassion and disenchantment. And through the dispassion, release. Not like we're just hoping to be sour about the world and just stay in that sourness. It's the point where you're no longer creating these things, and the fact that you stop creating these things, then something opens up in the mind. That's the whole point of the teaching. So learn to use the Buddha's teachings for their intended purpose, to induce this sense of disenchantment, dispassion that opens out onto the deathless. This is how you practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. In other words, you're not to continue with your old notions. You have to be willing to have a reversal inside the mind. Be open to that possibility. This might be a really good thing to have a lot of your presuppositions questioned. And John Mont's students said that he, one of his favorite topics for Dharma talks was precisely this: the practice of the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. He came under a lot of flack during his lifetime for going against old Thai customs and the way he practiced. He used to say, well, the customs of any country, whether they're Thai or Lao or whatever, they're all the customs of, peop customs of people with defilements. And practicing the Dharma in accordance with your defilements, that doesn't get you anywhere. You want to do what the Dharma requires, and the Dharma aims it right, right here. A sense of disenchantment, dispassion. That goes against a lot of every culture's values, no matter what, whether it's an Asian culture or a Western culture. All cultures are rooted in desires, just like all things are rooted in desire. So you have to be willing to have a lot of your preconceived notions, a lot of your underlying presuppositions questioned. If you see where they're leading to suffering, you can be willing to let them go. Because what waits on the other side of this passion and disenchantment, when they're done properly, is total release, total freedom. That, as the Buddha said, is the, the one taste that permeates all of the Dharma the taste of release.